Hello and welcome to the very last lecture at American Government. You've made it. Aren't you excited? Or sad, I'm sure. More, let's go with sad. And today we're going to be talking about U.S. foreign policy, which is one of the more interesting, in my opinion, aspects of, aspects of government. Um, and I want to start out by comparing us in the United States to the rest of the world. And I've got a little chart here, which will show you how we're doing. We have a population of closer to 330 million. This is a little dated, although the population grows really fast. We have about, though, about 4.5% of the world's population. Average lifespan in the United States at birth is 70, about almost 78 years versus 68 globally. So, in other words, we live on average about 10 years longer. We consume 31% of the world's meat with less than 5% of the world's population. And we consume nearly a fourth of the world's oil with 4.5% of the population. We also spend only about 10% of our budget on food versus globally the average person spends over a third. And all these indicators are, we're doing pretty well. Standard of living today is higher than at any time in human history. Um, we're living better than 99.9% .9 of all humans who've ever lived have lived. And we're living better than most of the rest of the world is today. Now, let's talk about history here. History of foreign policy. If you go all the way back to our man, George Washington, our first president, in his farewell address... He warned us against getting involved in the affairs of other countries and avoid entangling alliances, he said. He argued for trade with other countries, but argued we should stay out of the affairs of Europe. Um, it's probably safe to say we followed that advice through the 19th century mostly. We avoided European wars, but increased international trade. In the 20th century, though, this was reversed. I think it's fair to say we have ignored Washington's advice and become much more involved in the rest of the world. Now, maybe this is good or maybe this is bad. This is ultimately your call. Um, you could argue that, you know, the world's a lot smaller today than it was in Washington's day. Easier travel, easier communications. Isolationism probably made more sense in the 1790s than it does in 2019. Um, this is obviously obviously debatable. Um, but what happened, and when we started, I mean, you can't, problem with history is we always want to zero in on one individual or one event, when usually things are a lot more complicated than that. Um, we, Woodrow Wilson is seen as one of the, uh, I guess, founding fathers, you could say, of modern U.S. foreign policy, although you could argue a number of other figures, too, like, um, Teddy Roosevelt, maybe, with the whole speak softly but carry a big stick philosophy. But Wilsonian foreign policy came about at the end of World War I. Woodrow Wilson's belief, he was president from 1913 until 1921, his belief was that U.S. foreign policy should focus on spreading democracy, spreading free trade and capitalism. Famously, he said, the world must be safe for democracy. At the end of World War I, he had a vision for what he called the League of Nations, in which countries would join and be able to air their grievances and resolve their differences peacefully. Um, ironically, although he played a major role in creating the League of Nations, ultimately the United States refused to join because we feared loss of sovereignty. So World War I is significant um, because it basically redrew much of the world. Um, and most of what we dealt with for the rest of the 20th century and into today can be traced back to World War I. The, the Ottoman Empire ends after a thousand years. The end of World War I, it's carved up. Um, Britain gets a mandate over the, over the Middle East. Um, they draw the Sox and Picode, famously draw the line separating um, Iraq and Syria. These are new countries that are carved out. The uh, Balfour Declaration is a legal basis for which Israel is going to be established in about 30 more years. Um, Turkey gets a new country, gets a new start. The Austro-Hungarian Empire is carved up as well. Um, and not the World War I leads as much of anger in Russia, which culminates in the Bolshevik Revolution. And this leads to the communists taking over the Soviet Union, which is going to be patterned for most of the rest of the 20th century. Um, the end of World War 
One, the United States emerges as a world power, but we don't really want that. The 1920s follow that up, and um, Warren Harding is elected in 1920 on a platform of promising to return us to normalcy, return to normalcy, which is a word he totally made up, by the way. And this return to normalcy means we're going to look inward. We're not going to worry about what's going on in Europe. We fought World War I. We feel like we didn't get anything out of it. So from now on, we're going to let the Europeans and the rest of the world deal with their own problems. Plus, it's the 1920s. If the war is over, the economy's good, it'll probably be good forever, right? The booze is flowing, jazz is popular. Is it time to party hard? Yes, it is. Of course, 1930s, we get the Great Depression. At that point, we don't want to get involved in the rest of the world because we got our own problems to deal with here. And you probably know what comes after this, right? You would be right if you said World War II. Um, Germany and Japan had both been expanding for years before December 7th, 1941, when Japan attacks Pearl Harbor and draws us into World War II. Perhaps if we had stood up to Hitler when he marched into the Rhineland, maybe we could have avoided World War II. But we didn't because we were isolationists. Um, the United States aligns with Britain, France, the Soviet Union, and China in World War II, and ultimately are victorious. We won't go into too much detail here. U.S. history, we talk about this in a whole lot more detail. Um, probably know the war ends when atomic bombs are dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, which forces them to, to surrender. And after World War II, the U.S. and the Soviet Union emerge as the two world powers. Also, in 1945, the United Nations is founded, and the whole idea being to prevent another world war. Remember, the League of Nations failed, the United Nations actually succeeds, and we join. And for all the flack it gets, 74 years later, we haven't had World War III yet. Maybe this is evidence the United Nations works. Maybe not. I mean, there's other factors, too, obviously. Of course... The United States and the Soviet Union had had what you could be called a shotgun marriage um, during World War II. We were only allies because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Once Germany is defeated, we no longer have a common enemy. And so the Cold War is a war of words between the United States and the Soviet Union. It's a ideological battle between democratic capitalism of the United States and our allies and communism of the Soviet Union and their allies. And the United States' main policy at this time is going to be containment through what's called the Truman Doctrine. We cannot go directly to war with the Soviet Union or with the Soviet's allies because if we do, they have nuclear weapons, we have nuclear weapons, it's going to be Armageddon. So we can't do that. <clears throat> what we can do is ensure that communism remains within its current borders. If it tries to go beyond where it already exists, we will provide support to anyone fighting communism. Money, weapons, maybe even ground troops if necessary. Also, the end of the war, World War II, we, the Marshall Plan, we pump billions of dollars into Western Europe to help those countries rebuild. Why do we do that? Because we're nice. Well, it was a nice thing to do, but we really did it to win over their support. And to ensure that they didn't go communist. Because if we don't, help them out, the Soviets will. And if the Soviets help them out, they're likely to go communist and align with the Soviets. If you're starving, then you're going to like whoever helps you. Um, we also, NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is formed in 1949. NATO was actually the first formal military alliance the United States enters into since we aligned with France during the Revolutionary War. And it was after the end of World War II that it was decided that the United States is going to be the world's policeman. Now, I know this is controversial today, but why did we choose to do that? The answer is because someone was going to do it. If it's not us, it's going to be the Soviet Union, most likely. Who would you rather it be? Today, of course, the Soviet Union's gone, but if it wasn't us today, who would it be? China? Russia, maybe? You want one of them? No. We are sort of... I think, in some ways, bought into our own um, I don't know if the word I'm looking. I don't want to say propaganda, although maybe that is the correct term here. In that we 
seem to believe that the rest of the world is ripping us off and that we're the ones suffering. The world system we have today is the one we built at the end of World War II and at the end of the Cold War. Um, foreign trade has actually enriched the United States beyond the wildest dreams of anyone who lived as recently as 50 years ago. Um, if you look, I'm, I understand trade is controversial, but if you look at it, look at it, take the big picture approach, the average person lives far better today than they did 50 years ago. No question about it. Now, if you're a garment worker in Harriman, Tennessee, and your plant closes and you're out of a job, that sucks. I get it. My grandmother worked in a hosiery mill most of her life. My mother did for seven years. I get it. Um, as a whole, though, we are better off than we ever have been. And most of what we do on the world stage is to benefit us. If we benefit other countries, that's great, but it's really to benefit us. Um, rebuilding Europe, we didn't do it out of the goodness of our heart. We did it because we wanted those countries to align with us. And it's worked. And in the last 75 years or so that we've been the world's policemen, we have not had World War III. And we are living better than any humans ever have. So... Something to keep in mind. All right. So Warsaw Pact, I should mention, was the other side of NATO. That was the Soviet Union and their allies. Um, we also see more nuclear weapons as more countries gain nuclear technology. China would develop nuclear weapons in the 60s, I believe. India in the 70s. Pakistan in the 1990s. Also North Korea in the 2000s. Um, there was a big debate between whether or not our foreign policy should focus on human rights or realpolitik. Real human rights is should we use our foreign policy to try to force or encourage other countries to respect human rights, freedom, democracy, things like that. Or should we use it only to benefit ourselves even if it means supporting regimes like, say, Saudi Arabia the royal family there, which murders probably thousands of people every year, but supplies us with oil. Since the end of the Cold War, there's actually been an increase in global instability. Why? Because the world was more simple then. You had the United States on one side, you had the Soviet Union on the other side. Today, you have the United States and no one else that can challenge us directly, but you have a lot of smaller factions and terrorist groups which can challenge us. Which brings us to this term you might have heard of, globalization. The world is smaller, you could say. Well, not literally, of course, but we are much more connected than ever before. Communication, technology, trade has connected us in ways that would have been impossible 50 years ago. Um, probably you are not wearing a single article of clothing that was made in the United States. Um, probably most of the electronics you have were not built in the United States. Um, the in a whole world is now one market, and communication, thanks to the Internet, is now instantaneous. Um, this has benefits and drawbacks. Benefits are we have a lot more stuff than we would have had before that. You think you could afford an iPhone if it was made in the United States? It probably cost 50% more or more. I mean, we'd get by with a lot less stuff if it was assembled here. Of course, the dark side of that is that these are these could be jobs in the United States that are instead overseas. We live in a unipolar world today in which we're the sole superpower. Um, but there are some challenges to this. China would be the most obvious one, or Russia, for example. Also, India could someday become a bigger rival to us. The European Union, if they ever get their stuff together, maybe even Brazil. The, um, this new global age is actually, some people have argued, intensified political, social, and military conflict. Um, people are, if you, people are sort of um, dividing based on ethnic identity, which can be reinforced through through internet and through uh, contact with people who believe as they do. You know, people today are able to connect with people who have similar ideas in ways they weren't able to. 100 years ago or even 20 years ago. You probably know ISIS has recruited probably thousands of supporters online, which is kind of shocking to think about, but 
groups like that can do it. I mean, these are people they never could have reached 20 years ago, but now they can because of technology. So there's sort of a dark side to this as well in that technology can is, is ultimately neutral and probably going to be you can make good things better and bad things worse. Um, one of the big conflicts in U.S. foreign policy is and always has been protecting our own interests and promoting democracy and human rights abroad. If we can do both at the same time, then that's what we'll do. Sometimes, though, you have to choose between the two. Like, for example, again, Saudi Arabia. You know, just a few months ago, the gov there was a the, Sa the government of Saudi Arabia murdered a journalist who was a U.S. resident who'd written articles critical of the royal family. They dismembered him with a bone saw while he was still alive. What do we do about this? They did this in Turkey, in their embassy there. What do we do about this? Well, we're dependent on Saudi oil, so do we stop buying oil from them? Maybe we should. Do you want to pay $6 a gallon for oil? You probably don't. This is an example here of where our own interests may conflict with promoting human rights. In other words, I mean, I think it's probably clear the right thing to do would be to punish them for doing that, but if punishment also hurts us, then we may not be willing to do it. Nuclear proliferation. There are a number of states, countries in the world which have nuclear weapons now. The club of nuclear powers would consist of the United States, Britain, France, uh, Russia, China, Israel, India, Pakistan, and North Korea. Do any of these countries scare you? Some of them probably scare you. Some of them probably don't. Uh, most people would probably say Pakistan and North Korea are going to be the two scariest, although some of the others may be, may be as well. Um, United Nations seeks to control nuclear proliferation. Um, since 1970, 190 countries have signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. I should explain, I guess, proliferation means spreading. So a country which signs this Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty agrees not to share nuclear technology with anyone else. Um, the other side, humanitarian intervention. Since the end of the Cold War, genocide is actually on the rise, which is disheartening. Places like Rwanda, um, Yugoslavia, Darfur... Um, in Yugoslavia, we actually, in the 1990s, we actually led a humanitarian intervention there. Um, Yugoslavia had fallen into civil war, broke apart into several other, other countries. Um, we led a, we, we led a bombing campaign there, which led, led the leaders of Croatia, Serbia, and Bosnia to come together and agree to end the fighting, even though we didn't have any real direct interest at stake there. Then we have what are called rogue states and failed states. What's the difference? A rogue state is a country or state that operates outside international laws and norms. Um, places like North Korea would be an example of this. Or, or Libya, or Iran for that matter. These are states that do what they want to do and they don't follow the rules and norms of, that most other states do follow. And of course, they can be dangerous because they're unpredictable. What's Kim Jong-un going to do now? We don't know. Perhaps even more dangerous, maybe more dangerous than rogue states, though, are failed states. And these are states that don't have functioning governments. So Somalia would be a classic example of this. In Somalia, there is a government, but it only controls a few blocks around the capital. Um, as a result of that, if you hear about Somalia in the news, it's usually because of pirates. Somal Somali pirates, most um, congregate off the coast of Somalia, and much of the world's shipping goes by there. So these pirates just get on boats, go out to ships, demand money not to attack. They're usually given it, and they go back. If there was a functioning government in Somalia, then we probably would be able to do something about this. We just go to the government and say, hey, do something about these pirates. If you do, we'll give you X amount of dollars in foreign aid. If you don't, we'll sanction you and maybe bomb you. But since the government can't control its own territory, there's literally nobody to talk to. So short of actually invading Somalia and installing ourselves as ruling there, there's not much we can do about these pirates. Non-state actors. These are also interesting in that they can be more difficult to deal with than states. If you're in a conflict with another country, 
how you deal with it is pretty simple. You negotiate. If that fails, you try to coerce them through sanctions. If that fails, maybe you bomb them. Well, how do you do this with groups like, say, I don't know, that are ideology-based, like, say, ISIS or Al-Qaeda? Um, their supporters can jump across state boundaries easily and blend in with civilian populations easily. So it's hard to, hard to say what we should do about them. Um, they're often shadowy. They're difficult to understand or predict what's going to happen. Um, negotiation, conventional warfare, both difficult, maybe impossible with dealing with <coughs> groups like this. So how do we deal with it? That's a problem that we're still trying to figure out now. Um, democracy. The Bush administration and the Obama administration, and to some extent the Trump administration, have made it clear that we will encourage democracy abroad. The Bush Doctrine, which was what George W. Bush announced shortly after the attacks of 9-11, um, said the U.S. will take military action to promote democratic principles and protect security and interests. So going back again to Wilsonianism, the idea that we should spread democracy and freedom abroad. How do we do this? Unilateralism or multilateralism? Do we go it alone or do we recruit allies to our side? Under the Bush administration, we sort of trended, I guess, towards unilateralism. Under Obama, more towards multilateralism. And under Trump, probably back towards unilateralism to some extent. All right, we've got to talk about the United Nations here. 192 members as of 2010. I don't think that's changed. I'd have to double check to be sure. It's a major international governmental organization, or IGO. And the idea here is that the United Nations is a place where member states can meet and air out their grievances and debate their issues and deal with their issues peacefully, established after World War II to prevent World War III. Um, security forces, U.S. has a permanent seat on the Security Council, as does the United Kingdom, Russia, China, and France. And all five of these members, these permanent seats, have a veto over any action the Security Council takes. Security Council is very important because it has the power to deploy troop, peacekeeping troops. But in order to do it, you, you have to get the United States, Russia, China, the UK, and France to agree. And getting all five of them on the same page is hard. Usually the US, Britain, and France are on one side and China and Russia are on the other. Or maybe four of the five are on one side, but either Russia or China is the holdout. So it's very difficult to, uh, to get things done with the Security Council. Talk about the Geneva Conventions. Um, these were adopted after World War II, after the genocide of World War II. Um, and they define lawful military combat and protect the rights of POW. So idea here is civilized warfare. All UN members are bound by the Geneva Conventions, although not all of them follow them in practice. Typically, the Geneva Conventions has a lot of things, but typically torture is not allowed, and POWs, prisoners of war, must be treated humanely. Of course, this asks some questions here. If it's a non-state or non-state actor, say a member of Al Qaeda or maybe ISIS, are they entitled to these Geneva Convention protections if they're captured? Well, technically, they're not fighting for a country, so letter of law, maybe not. But it's also one of those things where that's kind of a technicality because they represent something that was not envisioned when the Geneva Conventions were agreed on and approved. It's like asking, you could argue, does the First Amendment protect how you arrange pixels on a glowing screen? I would say the spirit would be, yeah, sure it does. Of course, that's what the founders intended, but... You could argue that that's not literal speech, although that's I don't think is a good argument. International courts, um, the court of International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court. Um, these are again mechanisms for resolving international conflicts. The United States opts out of the ICJ in when it believes international law doesn't apply or that U.S. law supersedes international law, and we don't take part in the international criminal court at all because our view is Americans can't be subjected to a higher court than the Supreme Court. Now there's some arguments for it. We usually encourage other countries to recognize the legitimacy of the International Criminal Court. So perhaps we set a bad precedent by not being a member. Some other public and private international organizations, the Peace Corps, 
These are your most well-known. Um, basically, the Peace Corps is created by John F. Kennedy, and it's a way for young people to serve outside of the military. You volunteer and you go maybe serve in a poor country, uh, maybe teaching school or building houses or roads or stuff like that. Um, the idea is soft power here. We send them, if people in poor countries encounter Americans who are working to help them, then they'll probably have more favorable opinions of Americans. So this is sort of a, um, a PR move as much as it is a humanitarian move. Um, the Ford Foundation, not to be confused with Ford Motors, this is a NGO that promotes democracy and tries to improve the developing world. Um, there's other NGOs too, do all kinds of things, uh, monitor human rights, economic and social conditions, things like that. So about trade, this is controversial. Um, you know, one way the United States exercises power over the rest of the world is through trade. And there's a guy named Thomas Friedman who famously wrote what he called the Golden Arches Theory of Conflict Resolution. And his argument is that no two countries, both of whom have a McDonald's, had ever gone to war with each other. Now, this no longer applies because Russia and Georgia have gone to war with each other and they both have McDonald's, although it's still very rare. So the key to world peace might be to build McDonald's and... Iraq and Syria, North Korea, right? Well, McDonald's is a symbol. Um, the reality is that countries that trade with each other typically don't go to war with each other. So more trade means we're less likely to go to war. Think of the relationship between the United States and China right now. Are the U.S. and China friends? No, we have very different interests. We are not friends at all. But are we likely to go to war with each other? The answer is probably not, because trade is one of the biggest reasons. Um, we like cheap plastic crap that we can buy in the stores, right? We like electronics. China likes to make money. There's no real incentive for either of us to go to war with the other, because if we do, we're going to lose many of our consumer goods, and China's and both of our economies are going to be devastated by this. So, the answer is trade might be one of the ways might reduce the risk of war. That's the, uh, that's the argument that Friedman makes. Now, protectionism and free trade. Um, protectionism would be protecting U.S. industry with tariffs on imports. You've probably heard tariffs have been in the news lately. Um, free trade attempts to break down barriers on imports. In other words, tax, tax imports little or not at all. So those are your two sides here. And the advantages and disadvantages of each are pretty obvious. Protectionism protects U.S. industry, but it also means you're going to be paying a lot more for the goods you buy if they're made in the United States or if they're imported. Free trade means you get cheaper goods, but it also means that jobs are being outsourced. The middle ground here is what's called fair trade. This is for the third way. Um, this states we can have free trade with another country as long as both nations have comparable working conditions and wages. So if we had fair trade, we would probably have free trade with Canada because they have comparable working conditions and wages, but not Mexico because they don't. Problem with fair trade, though, is that it's not really going to get you cheaper consumer goods. Canada is not called what makes... American goods so expensive com compared to those made in in a pork in developing countries is that wages and regulations are low. If you have two countries with comparable wages and working conditions, then the price of the goods they produce is going to be roughly equal. 19th and early 20th century, protectionism was more prominent since the end of World War II. Free trade has been a trend, which may be declining now. We may be getting more back towards tariffs. Um, in the 90s, we got NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, um, which established a freer trade zone between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Also, most favored nation status. What this most favored nation status means is we take the best trade deal we have with any foreign country, that's the most favored nation. 
and we give that same agreement to any other country. So if you have most favored nation status, it means you have the best trade agreement with us that we offer. Last but not least, something we don't think about, but maybe should, or actually we do think about this sometimes, although usually more hysteria than rationality. World health. You know, diseases can spread much faster than at any time in human history because people are much more mobile. They travel a whole lot more. Um, think of this. A passenger jet may have 350 passengers aboard. If one of them has a contagious disease, every all 350 people on board have now been exposed. And those 350 people, there's probably someone from every inhabited continent in the world on there. And, of course, they get off the plane, they get on other planes, they go home, they take it with them. And within 48 hours, whatever that disease is, is spread to every continent. Does this scare you? There's a great movie called Contagion, which is worth watching if you, if you get a chance. It's about, it's about um, like a worldwide pandemic. You might have heard of Ebola or the swine flu um, or, or the uh, bird flu. These were pandemics, which didn't really hit the United States very hard, although there was fear that they would. Um, someday, something like this is going to hit us. Um, you know, you might have heard, if you've taken history about the, uh, the Spanish influenza pandemic of 1918, um, towards the, this is hit at the end of World War I, you no know, World War I, trench warfare. Um, soldiers would spend weeks at a time or months even at a time in trenches. Um, people be killed around them. Their bodies would just fall down the trench with them and decompose. Obviously, there's no sanitation, so everybody just goes to the bathroom in the trenches too. Obviously, this is going to become extremely disgusting with rats and bugs and all kinds of horrible diseases spread. And out of this came a particularly, particularly bad strain of the flu called the Spanish influenza. And when the war ends, everybody goes home and they take it with them. So it's all over the world. It's estimated that about 5% of the world's population died after contracting the Spanish influenza. It's estimated that about a third of the world's population was infected. I know in Harriman, um, so many people died from it that the funeral homes didn't have enough space to accommodate all the bodies. Um, could something like that happen today? The answer is yes, and it would probably be worse today because one, people travel a lot more, so it would spread faster and farther, and two, it would also <coughs> be made worse by the fact that we have social media, the internet, and cable news, which would be blaring this 24-7, which I think would cause panic. Um, I mean, keep remember, just a year or two ago, we all lost our minds over clowns, right? Um, when people actually start dying, when there's actually something to be afraid of, I'm afraid of, like, I, I'm afraid of what would happen. If something like Spanish influenza happened in 1918 happened today, I, it's, I don't think it's, I'm being overdramatic by saying I think that our government could collapse. Now, I hope we don't find this out, but this is something we need to, need to be concerned about. Um, we have the world, the Centers for Disease Control. Their job is to monitor and prevent stuff like this from happening. If you want to make an argument for the UN, probably the World Health Organization, which is a division of the UN, is the strongest argument for it. That should be WHO, not WTO, sorry. Um, but they provide health care around the world. They go into the developing world and vaccinate people against communicable diseases, which, all, which is in our interest. Um, an outbreak in a slum in, say, India, would reach our shores within 48 hours. So best thing we can do is wipe these things out is before they start. And that's one thing that the uh, World Health Organization attempts to do. All right, that is all I have for this semester. I hope you've enjoyed this class. I have enjoyed teaching it. Um, if, as always, you have any questions or concerns, please, by all means, let me know. If in the future you should ever need me for anything, feel free to to give me a call or shoot me an email or stop by and see me. Hope you have a good rest of your life. Goodbye.